By the time the TC arrived, the luxury lines were dropped from production. Like most car manufacturers of the time, the war put the brakes on any new car models. And the post-war industry was simply a matter of dusting off old designs and going back into production. This was exactly what the MG Car Company did, starting production of the MG TC in September 1945, with very minor changes from the original TA and TB models. TC was a pre-war car in a post-war market, and management at MG didn't have any high hopes for its success, but forged ahead anyway while they worked on designs for future models. Surprisingly, the MG TC was a hit with car buyers. While the USA was producing large and quite comfortable rides with loads of power, the MG TC was a loud, small-engine fun machine and was considered a real driver's car. This reputation led to the TC being the most successful car to come out of the MG plant since its inception in 1928. Exactly 10,000 production versions of the MG TC were produced from September 1945 to November 1949. A larger number than any previous MG model. It cost £527 on the home market in 1947, which would be about £21,000 in today's currency or about 33,000 US dollars. Many of the TCs were exported from the UK to the USA, even though it was never built in a left-hand drive configuration. The version of the TC exported to the USA did have some minor differences. The headlights were slightly smaller and were a sealed beam variety to meet US safety regulations. The twin rear lights were larger for the same reason. The US also demanded turn signals or indicators for local registration. To top it off, the US TCs also featured chrome bumpers as standard. This particular MG TC is a fantastic example of a beautifully kept vehicle. The styling is unmistakable with the classic wire wheels, synonymous with MGs, featuring the propeller style knockoff, emblazoned with the MG logo. The organic lines of the rolling fenders that sweep right back to create running boards are in stark contrast to the angular, rigid structural design of the front end and the classic tall grille. Rounded chrome external headlights really accentuate the initial design era of the vehicle. Later models had these incorporated into the fenders for a more modern look. Driver comforts are at a minimum in the MG TC. A cockpit-style driver positioned in front of a very retro-spoke steering wheel set the tone for a plain but functional interior. Classic instrumentation spread right across the dashboard, a flat windscreen and suicide doors are all hallmarks of a time long gone. Under the hood, the MG TC was no muscle car, using the same power plant as the Morris 10. This was the XPAG engine first released in the late 1930s, featuring four cylinders at 1,250cc. With overhead valves, it produced a modest 54.5 horsepower at 5,200 RPMs. It was a reliable workhorse though, and had enough juice to keep the driver in that low cockpit flying around the corners. For a classic roadster like this, the hood or rag top is really just for rainy days and rumour has it, if you are caught out for a drive in the sun with the roof up, you will get a ribbing from any fellow MGT drivers. And so you should. MGTs stayed in production until 1955. Over 56,000 cars and 21 years later it was replaced by the MGA. 
Not bad for a midget. Here's a challenge for all you classic car fans. Now your Chrome gives you a peek at some close-ups of classic Chrome. Look at the shapes. Do you recognise the lines? Can you tell which car sports this shiny styling? It's too early for clues. But we can tell you it's a car, it's a classic, and it's very, very cool. Look closely, and we'll give you more hints later in the show. Next on CC, the classic car show. An exciting way to land yourself a classic car. A great jag of tomorrow, and our buyer's guide to Porsche. When you're hunting for a classic car, there are a few ways to go. Classics are categorised into three classifications that describe the condition of the vehicle. There's original cars, restore cars and barn finds. Original cars are vehicles that have been driven over their lifetime and are still likely to be on the road today. They have not been resprayed or restored and can sometimes have non-factory modifications made to them over time. The classic version is the little old lady who drove it to church on Sundays. Restore cars are exactly that. Cars that have been meticulously restored to their former glory. Often bare metal restorations with everything in its place. These vehicles are generally pretty expensive, but are real head turners. There is, however, a much more exciting way to land yourself a classic car. Much like hunting for treasure, you can keep an eye out when travelling in the country for the elusive barn find. But what is a barn find? A barn find is generally exactly that. It's something that's found in a property or an old barn. Uh, its condition may be good, but in most cases it's generally pretty poor because it's been used and in many cases abused. You have to remember these cars have probably gone through many hands before they've finally ended their days sitting in a barn. The barn find can be an exciting experience. It's not unusual to discover more than one car in a large barn, and sometimes they are in excellent condition. More often than not though, the barn finds are a whole lot of hard work. The general state of a barn find can be not too bad if it's been kept or at least preserved to some extent by sitting in the barn. However, in many cases, it may mean that there have been rats inside the car and they've eaten the upholstery, they've laid nests in the upholstery. In some cases, other wild animals have uh, got into the car, or in some cases people have taken the doors off and allowed the car to be used as a sort of chook shed or something. So the interior of the car can be in a really, really appalling condition. The exterior of the car might not be too bad, but then again, if it's had years of rust, etc., then it's decayed quite a bit. So it all sounds like a lot of hard work. Surely it would be better to get hold of a running classic and restore it from there. Well, not always. The advantage of finding a barn find is in many cases you will get an unmolested car, hopefully, in which case it has all its what's known as jewellery, which is all the chrome work, etc., still with the vehicle. Obviously the, the most desirable barn finds are those cars that are considered to be very desirable, like Bugattis or Rolls-Royce, etc. And in some cases people do find them in barns. In some cases people have opened a barn and literally found a car that is very, very desirable. Uh, in America particularly they have found what were known as concept cars, cars that were produced by car companies as a one-off, shown at a motor show, and then in theory they were scrapped, but in reality they weren't. And uh, some people have had the luck of opening a barn and finding a concept car, which is unique, it's a one-off. We don't condone snooping around other people's property though. If you do spot a car that you would like a closer look at, you need to contact the property owner to organise a closer inspection, like we did with these beauties.
Classic car fans will always be searching for those elusive treasure moments, but they don't come along often. And remember not to get too excited by a rusting hulk in a shed somewhere, unless you really, really love it, or it's a collector's car. It could be more hassle than it's worth. Today's classic of tomorrow is from a British car maker with an enviable list of true classic cars under its belt. Only a handful of cars are recognisable in an instant, like classic Jaguars, with their sleek lines and bold distinct styling. As we move through the evolution of any manufacturer, we see a convergence of design ideas. The selection of sports cars on offer was once an eclectic mix of unique cars. Now sometimes it can be hard to tell them apart. This is the Jaguar XKR. In the grand tradition of high-powered performance Jaguars, it's a supercharged 5-litre V8 that packs quite a punch. Designed by Ian Callum, the man behind the styling of the Aston Martin Vantage. So how much does it cost to buy a performance car of today that will be a classic of tomorrow? Around £60,000, or about US dollars will get you a new one. It will depreciate in value fairly quickly, but hold on to it and look after it, and you will have a classic of tomorrow. You might just have to wait about 40 years. 40 years of fun driving, though. So you've always dreamed of owning a Formula One race car, tearing around the track at 200 miles an hour. But maybe you just don't have the millions to spare. So it's time to look for something a little more practical that will still fuel your high octane dream, like a Porsche 911. We took a look around to see just how deep your pockets need to be to get behind the wheel of one of the most successful competition cars of all time. Since its introduction in 1963, the Porsche 911 has undergone continuous development, but the basic concept has remained the same, with its rear engine design and independent rear suspension. <laughs> the most notable change was the introduction in 1998 of a water-cooled engine replacing the previously air-cooled power plant. Although there are always many risks that require thorough research when buying second-hand cars, many Porsche 911 owners are generally enthusiasts who have taken good care of their vehicles. Woo! We went shopping for the 1969 model. Like this slick black speedster for around $30,000 or £18,000. Another option was our 1970s 2.2 litre at just under $43,000 or £26,000. A tad more pricey, but worth every penny after being fully restored to its original pristine condition, this 1969 White Dazzle was fetching around $60,000 or £37,000. With so many of these elegant beauties available throughout the market, you'll be sure to find that thrill ride you've been looking for without costing you the earth. So how well did you go with your first peak? How well did you know your chrome? Here's a quick update. Did you guess it right away or are you still pondering? Take a look at these shots. We're showing you a little more of the car here, so you should be able to pick it. The answer is coming soon. Next on CC, Classic Cars, we reveal the Know Your Chrome mystery car and then go for a cruise in some classic American monsters. So how well did you know your Chrome? If you said it was a Maserati Mirac, you would be right. Introduced in 1972, the V6 Maserati Mirac was a cheaper, lighter and less powerful version of the Maserati Bora. lower weight ratio and better weight distribution, the Marek may have had less power, but it handled far better than its V8 counterpart. Ladies, gentlemen, the magic of the past doesn't last. What we want to see is, is the magic of the, the present. present. The new Oldsmobile.
you will be enchanted by its comfort and power. In this car, you feel like everything's coming up roses. Some may say that they just don't make them like they used to, and in the case of this pair of 1960 Yank tanks, they definitely don't. Oldsmobiles were produced from 1949 until 1999 as a division of General Motors, and from 1950 to 1974, the 88 was the division's top-selling line. This is Yank 60, a 1960 Oldsmobile Dynamic 88 four-door sedan. It comes with a veranda roof. And this is Tank 60, also a 1960 Oldsmobile Dynamic 88, but this is the sportier two-door coupe. Both Yank and Tank are fourth generation 88s and the pride and joy of father and son team, John and Scott Clisby. I've had the Oldsmobile for probably 10 years now. Um, bought it uh, locally. My father's uh, was actually a 50th birthday present, um, so he's had his for about 10 years as well. So um, yeah, it's quite good fun. Uh, almost matching cars, same year, same make, uh, same model. The fourth generation models were completely restyled by General Motors with a longer, lower and wider body, which was promoted as the linear look by the American manufacturer. Other changes included a new grille and tail lights, a revised rear design, and a modernised instrument panel. These cars were built for cruising, with a soft suspension and turning circle of a jumbo jet, and a larger than life personality. Under the hood, both these beauties are powered by the same 371 cubic inch rocket V8 that was carried over from the 57 58 models and came as standard on all dynamic 88s of the year. While many cars of the time feature bigger and sharper fins and tons of chrome, the fourth generation 88s featured a more subdued look with subtle oval fins and much less chrome. Yet both these cars with their sharp 60s stylings still make their own undeniable statement to the world. Yeah, uh, probably if you're looking to buy one today, you're probably looking around um, $20,000 to buy one. Um, as far as worldwide production figures, I think they only made um, around the 50, 60,000 for the year. Um, so again, it's not a huge volume, but um, yeah, a few of them have still survived and a few are still going. The driving experience is great and they're so easy to handle, with power steering that makes these giants surprisingly responsive. They're also very comfortable with a six-way power seat that adjusts your driving position backwards, forwards, up or down, a feature not fitted as standard on many modern cars. For a 1960 car, it's got um, power seats. Um, it's a pillarless car, which means you can wind down the windows and have no uh, door pillars. Um, they come with uh, an electronic eye, which is a headlight sensor um, gadget, gizmo from the 60s. Um, and yeah, it's a large V8, uh, automatic, very comfy to, to ride around in, very drivable car. As far as maintenance goes, most of the drivetrain is American and available. Body parts are a bit harder to find, and you'll need to source those from the States if you have to. Of course, these parts are getting harder to find even in the US, as stock things out after a half a century of bumps and dings. General tuning and maintenance is pretty straightforward though, and you should be able to get most components over the internet or even locally. The great thing about owning any classic car is that their running costs are about the same as a new car. Yep, they sure don't make them like they used to, but at least, with a few classics still doing the rounds, the good news is that they don't have to. 
So what does Scott think is the best thing about being the owner of an Oldsmobile Dynamic 88? Oh, it's just a cool car to cruise around in. You know, you get lots of looks, um, people always stopping you, asking questions about it. And um, yeah, it was just a classic car that, um, you know, if I look after it, it's, it's one of the few cars that will actually appreciate over time and become more and more collectible. Classic cars are everywhere, from the much-loved runabout to the rare and valuable collector's items. One thing we all agree, there's nothing better than a classic, like this stunning Jaguar sports car that was once owned by Hollywood tough guy Steve McQueen. Or this Rover P6, voted the very first European car of the year. Of course, you don't have to be rich to drive a classic. You just have to love classic cars.